Hello, and welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Jose Estigarraga, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. As we close out 2021 and look towards 2022, we are pleased to present this mini-series of podcasts that will review key developments over the past year across a number of important geographic regions, industries, and specialisms. And we'll look ahead to consider what the next 12 months might bring. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights, and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Arbitral Insights. Today, we have myself, Elizabeth Farrell, and Richard Swinburne. We are both members of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Team and Energy and Natural Resources Specialists. We're going to be spending today looking back at trends that we have observed in commodities arbitrations during 2021 and looking ahead to 2022 and beyond. So let's get started. Richard, starting at a very high level, what would you say are the biggest trends we've seen on the disputes side of the commodities sector in 2021? Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, so several features, I guess. I think everybody knows very well that there were extraordinary market conditions during 2020, largely sort of COVID related. And I think what we've therefore seen in 2021 is those market conditions flowing through into disputes which are coming to arbitration. So just to sort of go back to 2020 as to the conditions which have led to so many disputes, clearly the sort of supply demand fundamentals were hugely affected by the onset of COVID and the resultant lockdowns that produced inevitably, you know, huge contract stress across almost all of the commodities. So a great deal of worry around force majeure or hardship or material adverse change situations. And really, fundamentally, price volatility, particularly as people will remember, extreme low prices, especially in the energy sector, negative pricing and so on. So all of that volatility feeds through to performance issues, defaults by counterparts for whom the uh, the contract was no longer either viable or in the market for them. So significant increase in claims, particularly, I suppose, by sellers more than by buyers, sellers let down by their buyers, So an increase in those defaults flowing through to arbitration and to litigation. And I suppose with that, an increased concern around the solvency and so the enforceability of the resulting awards that one would obtain. So that's going back to 2020, really. And then the the way we've seen that in 2021. But of course, in 2021, the market conditions again, have been very complex in as much as the lockdowns globally have eased. So the demand side has come back. And therefore, again, there's been volatility in the sector. Uh, So probably more volatility this time having regard to the upsurge in demand and, and stresses in the supply side. So and that's been particularly acute. And that therefore is how we have seen it. In the energy sector, you could almost say in any of the energy commodities, so coal or oil, it's particularly noticeable from our perspective on the LNG side. That in itself is an interesting market in as much as it was really a a sort of end to end producer consumer market that has changed over the last several years. So there are new players in the market. There is a, a spot market to a degree. But if one overlays that change in structure with the extreme volatility that is being so widely reported at the moment, then again, one sees performance issues. And I think in that sector in particular, there are a number of features of it which mean that there is a a greater tendency for disputes than there used to be. So a lot of the time, the contracting is looking back to the historic way in which the market conducted its business. So quite often old style 
MSPAs and SPAs, but with the volatility and new players in the market and the sophistication of the production and the transportation, one sees many more disputes, I think, than perhaps historically one saw, characterised perhaps by you know, the, the concerns around timing, how important it is to have vessels in the right place at the right time to unite with cargoes, around the way in which compensation is calculated in the contracts, around liability caps, and so on. So there's definitely been a marked increase in disputes. There's usually a lot of money involved, whether that's on the sale and purchase side or the freight side. And I suppose over and above everything, perhaps there's a great tendency to litigate a dispute, whereas previously perhaps that tendency was not there because of the nature of the relationship between the producer and the consumer. So that has definitely been a trend. But Elizabeth, I know that you've been heavily involved in a raft of disputes, which probably, again, have their roots back in the turbulent market conditions of 2020, but which I guess we could say have been characterised by an altogether uglier side. Do you want to tell us a little bit about those? Absolutely. And and thank you, Richard. We have certainly seen a real uptick in disputes over the last, well, since the beginning of COVID. And with that, their roots in 2020, as you say, Richard, in particular, disputes arising out of ultimately insolvencies. So I'm thinking about the Hin Leong insolvency in Singapore. I'm thinking about Phoenix, uh, Phoenix both in Dubai and Singapore becoming insolvent, the agri-trade insolvency cases, all of which have their roots seemingly, although we don't know necessarily the full facts yet, but seemingly in trades that went wrong, partly because of market volatility. In the case of Hin Leong derivatives trading, which seems to have been ill-advised in retrospect, given market changes in the oil market, but which also involve allegations of fraud. These are allegations of fraud which have come into the light because, it seems to me, partly as a result of COVID, meaning that fraudsters, to the extent that (laughs) they were involved, were exposed because with lockdowns, with interruptions to the flow of physical documents like bills of lading, it became clearer that there were some dodgy activities going on. And not moving away specifically from those cases, we have certainly seen an increase in bills of lading fraud, in warehouse receipt frauds being discovered in the last year and a half since COVID began. They have been, to a lesser or greater extent, something of a shock, I would say, for the the trade finance markets in particular, have accelerated in some cases exits from the trade finance market by financiers who, having become aware of fraud in the market, documentary fraud, have, during the last 18 months, have decided that it's (laughs) simply not worth the candle. Where Where some exit, others enter. I think as you've touched on already, Richard, price volatility in itself tends to lead to an increase in disputes, an increase in arbitration as people look for ways out of their contractual arrangements. If they've agreed a price which is way out of line with the market when they come to have to either deliver or take delivery. In some cases, there may well be breaches by a counterparty which can be used to escape from a contract. If the contract market's difference is so huge, then that can lead people to engage in arbitration rather than to simply settle and accept a bit of a loss. I wonder also whether for some companies in times where cash flow has been a little bit tight, there is a desire to pursue and sometimes as a defendant or respondent not to settle an arbitration because in doing so, of course, you're putting off <laughs> the need to actually pay out any cash until a, until a later date. So I would say we've seen fewer commercial resolutions of disputes in the last 18 months, two years than we might usually do. And so I don't want to speculate too much about that and why that might be, but I've certainly offered a, a couple of thoughts on that. <laughs> 
Elizabeth, just coming back to those examples of the insolvencies that you referred to and the the impact that they have had on the trade finance industry, what, if any, lessons do you think can be drawn from those, or is it too early to say? Well, for the purposes of this podcast, I'm not going to say it's too early to say, although I'm sure there will be more lessons that become apparent in the next few years. But for now, I mean, I think there is certainly a trend back to making sure that one is not relying too heavily on documents produced by the beneficiaries of financing, but rather an investment in having boots on the ground. If commodities are supposed to be stored in warehouses, a resurgence of interest in collateral management agreements, or at least stock monitoring agreements that require independent individuals to be there, checking movements in and out, making sure that warehouse receipts are issued only once in hard copy and originals. Dealing with bills of lading fraud is somewhat more challenging. For containerized shipments, we have high value containerized shipments. We've certainly seen an increase in the use of um, some of the container lines tracking services, some of which are free to access, some of which not, but an increase in use of those services to actually track where cargoes are supposed to be and therefore where, you know, we've had circumstances where we've seen cargoes that have been unloaded when they're supposed to have just been, have been unloaded at destination when they're supposed to have just been loaded. And, uh, you know, we've seen bills of lading, which turn out to be fraudulent issued the, <laughs> a day before they've actually been discharged. So, you know, th- there are some practical steps that can be taken, but we are still some way from, and this is a topic of an entirely different podcast, I think, but we're some way from electronic bills of lading being fully integrated into a, a traceable system. And therefore, one could only speculate that it's, it's a little too, too early to really do much about sort of preventing bill of lading fraud. However, I think there are some lessons to be learned for those involved in contractual negotiations and for lawyers involved in drafting agreements, all of which really are related to keeping in mind at an early stage enforcement issues because some common threads from some of the insolvency cases that I've been talking about are, of course, you know, multiple creditors all trying to consider where they can pursue potential enforcement within group companies against individuals who may have given uh, personal guarantees and looking at trying to look outside that insolvency structure, as well, of course, as insurance claims. But in order to increase one's chances of successful enforcement, of course, as an arbitration practitioner, I think the first thing that ought to be acknowledged is um, the usefulness of the New York Convention and the enforcement possibilities that gives one. But I would still advise anybody entering into long-term high-value agreements with counterparties based in countries with perhaps less developed legal systems, not to simply rely on the fact that such a country is a signatory to the New York Convention, but to go beyond that and consider to what extent there are public policy or other exceptions which are applied by the judiciary in those jurisdictions that might impact enforcement of an arbitral award. For example, we have experiences of parties coming a real cropper on enforcement when they have entered into a contract which has what I would refer to as a hybrid court arbitration jurisdiction clause. That is a clause which says that one of the parties has the option to refer a dispute to either arbitration or to court. Now, on the face of it, such a clause is really useful because one would think that gives the party who's got that option a very useful ability to potentially (laughs) cut its cloth to suit its situation. And when a dispute arises, consider whether arbitration or court is the most likely to to result in a a cost-effective and quick uh, resolution. But when it comes to enforcement, there are places in the world where I'm not a Chinese lawyer or a Dubai-based lawyer myself. I understand that in China, Dubai and in other countries, local courts may not accept that an arbitration 
that is the result of a dispute being referred to arbitration under a hybrid clause, that the award of that arbitration is enforceable in that jurisdiction. And that's on the basis that they would say no clear arbitration agreement in the relevant contract. So I would say if you're really seriously concerned about enforcement prospects and you want to be able to enforce an arbitration award under the New York Convention, consider simply having a simple arbitration agreement, arbitration clause in your contract. And I would also, you know, in our in our business commodities world, particularly in certain trades like the oil market, we're well used to issues arising in any dispute as to whether a contract has been formed and if so, what the terms of that contract are. And the reason for that being that typically a contract is entered into by an exchange of traders over the phone or possibly by email, which is sometimes referred to as the contract recap. Um, That contract recap will be the stage at which agreement is reached, but it will only contain a limited number of terms, the terms in which the traders are really particularly interested, price, quantity, quality, maybe something about delivery dates. Very rarely do traders discuss even governing law, let alone whether there's an arbitration agreement or not at that early stage. Then the um, contracts departments of the, the parties get going, producing very long form contracts which are exchanged and negotiated at length and there are very often questions about whether a final agreement is reached on the terms of those long-form confirmations or whether the only applicable contract terms are those agreed in the initial discussion or initial email exchange between the traders. And this has really come to the fore in a recent case, it's an English court case where the court set aside two GAFTA arbitration awards. It's known as the the Black Sea case. And the reason the court overturned those awards was because they said that there was no binding arbitration agreement between the parties. And that was basically because the GAFTA arbitration agreement was contained in the long form exchanges between the parties, which were never concluded with an agreement. There was an agreement between the parties, but that was only the initial exchanges between the traders, in which, of course, they didn't mention arbitration, or certainly didn't come to an agreement that disputes would be referred to arbitration. So I suppose if there's a lesson to be learned there, it might be the somewhat unrealistic one of um, encouraging traders to discuss or at least mention in uh, email exchanges when they're doing a deal that a particular governing law will apply and the arbitrate, you know, and even to say something as simple as ICC arbitration or LCIA arbitration over any disputes or whatever it might be, but to specify that arbitration agreement in the initial exchanges so that there can be no doubt that when one comes to the awful possibility of a dispute, that the right forum for that dispute to be determined is indeed arbitration. So I suppose a couple of tips there. One, avoiding hybrid arbitration court clause is to making sure that commercial teams are aware that it's best practice to refer to arbitration agreement if one is intended in the early exchanges. Moving on, you know, we're now November 2021 as we record this, looking forward to Christmas and New Year celebrations. So Richard, I wonder what your crystal ball says about trends in the commodity sector in 2022 and maybe beyond when it comes to disputes. Thank you, Elizabeth. I suppose if I really had a crystal ball, I would be a commodity trader, not a lawyer. But I think from where you know we sit as lawyers, and in fact, from where we sit as members of the public reading the press, we're in a situation at the moment where there's kind of a double header, the sort of impacts of COVID hopefully winding down, if you like, and the demand side on the commodity sector, therefore, rising up again, combined, though, with a definite acceleration, which is a good thing, of course, towards energy transition. And if you put those two things together, then I think, logically, the demand side of the commodity sector is only, particularly in the energy sector, but more broadly across the metals sector as well, is only going to be going in one direction, and that's up in the next year and the next few years, whether that be around sort of energy transition commodities. So for instance, copper, cobalt, nickel, the metals that are going to 
feed the EV industry on the one hand, or whether it's you know traditional energy products, oil, coal, gas, as we go forward. So one combines that with the supply side, perhaps not getting the investment uh, in traditional fossil fuel based commodities, as has been the case, then of course, inevitably, we're going to see more market stress, and so on. So in a way, it's perhaps more of the same. So price volatility tends to convert to disputes. And I think that will be the pattern in coming months, even years with that volatility. Otherwise, I suppose a trend that we see and hear about more is, if you like, the growing impact of regulation and compliance in the broadest possible sense of those words. So everything really from whether it's sort of sanctions or FCPA, Bribery Act type compliance, whether it's the widening of traditional financial regulation to the sector, or increasingly whether it's ESG related compliance issues. And I think with that wider regulatory environment and the greater number of investigations and so on, inevitably that breeds spin-off, knock-on litigation. So I think that will be a, a continuing trend and probably a growing pattern. So I think that's what my crystal ball would reveal for the, the coming year and probably a little bit longer than that, I would have thought. So I guess before we wrap up, Elizabeth, it's probably worth saying that really we focus so far on the market conditions and what that has meant in terms of the sector in the last couple of years. But I think both of us have observed that the way in which commodity disputes are being handled in the last couple of years in 2021 and and, and potentially for the future have changed a little bit. So is it worth our while, I wonder, just saying a few words before we close about that. Maybe if I just start something on the very positive side, and that is the speed with which certainly, you know, sat here in the UK, certainly the court system and the arbitration system, be that trade arbitration or international arbitration organisations, switch from a traditional in-person dispute resolution process to a virtual dispute resolution process. And that was, I think, remarkable. It was a bit like the switch all of us made to suddenly working from home. So from certainly from my own experiences, that has worked very, very well. And it's had some real benefits. I think people have been able to manage and deal with the examination and cross-examination of witnesses remotely better than they anticipated they would. Probably not actually as good as in person, but nearly as good as in person. I think the availability of everybody virtually as opposed to in person has obviously meant that it's possible to get everybody together at far shorter notice than it would be if you had to get everybody flying to a particular location to have a hearing. So that is good. One of the less likely or or less perhaps foreseeable consequences is I think that there's greater engagement in a way by some of the parties to the litigation because it's quite possible for the business people involved in many of the disputes who ordinarily wouldn't be able to leave their desks, if you like, to attend a hearing, they've been able to participate or to watch the hearings take place from their desks or their homes or whatever. And I think that therefore has been a good thing because it's shown justice, if you like, being done. So that that is all good. And of course, now we are coming out of COVID. We are in a world where in-person hearings can, to a degree, take place again. So we're seeing now a sort of palette of possibilities, in-person hearings, virtual hearings, and hybrid hearings, a mixture of the two, if you like. So all of that, I think, is a positive step, and I would hope it would continue for the foreseeable. Elizabeth, I know you've got a couple of points quickly to mention on the procedural side, born of your own experience. Would you want to just mention those? Absolutely. I think just to start off, I'd say, you know, we deal with commodity arbitration. What we really mean by that is just what it says on the tin. So any arbitration that involves a dispute in the commodities sector. So that is arbitrations under a really wide range of arbitral institutions rules, whether it be ICC, whether it be LCIA, SIAC, or one of the what we call commodities trade arbitrations. So GAFTA, FOSFA, the Refined Sugar Association's rules, sometimes the LMAA, 
when therefore I talk about procedural points, I am referring to all of the above, because I think there are a number of trends we've seen, some of which are led by developments, changes in the courts, the English courts rules. So in particular, in the last 18 months, there have been two huge changes in the English commercial courts procedural rules, one of which concerns disclosure, uh, the disclosure process something which I describe in a lot of detail in another podcast, which I did with my colleague Alexander Sandiforth within our Trading Straits podcast series. It's the podcast known as Dispute Resolution, Recent Developments and Court Procedure. So I won't repeat myself too much on this podcast, save to say that in part because there are a large number of lawyers who practice court disputes who also do arbitration work, and because many of the court's reforms are perfectly sensible, I expect that there will be more and more convergence between the way that disclosure of documents is handled in arbitration and the way it is done in the English courts. Similarly, the second big change in the way the English courts handle procedure is in in relation to much stricter rules imposed on the way witness statements are taken. And my colleagues Susie Savage and Dan Newbound discussed that in detail in one of the previous Arbitral Insights podcasts in this series named Implications of New English Witness Statement Reforms for International Arbitration where they really talk about some of the pioneering measures the English courts have introduced to deal with witness statement taking, which are aimed at improving the quality of witness recollection, and how those reforms are likely to influence how international arbitration practitioners and institutions respond to the challenge of taking witness evidence in the future. And finally, I suppose no podcast that looks back at international arbitration over the last couple of years would be complete without mentioning the case of Halliburton and Chubb, covered in great detail in uh, several publications by Reed Smith, but most recently discussed in the context of the commodities and shipping sector by our colleagues Fasia Payataki and Thor Malouf in, again, a Trading Straits podcast. Point being that the result of that decision is that although trade arbitrations like GAFTA and FOSPA that I mentioned before are carved out from the decision in Halliburton and Chubb, which constrains the way in which arbitrators can accept multiple appointments for the same parties, those trade arbitration institutions were carved out on the basis effectively that there is an industry practice in certain commodities trade arbitrations that the same few arbitrators will accept numerous appointments by the limited number of parties who participate in the trade. Nevertheless, even in those trade arbitrations, even though they are carved out from Halliburton and Chubb, we have still seen arbitrators making lengthy and detailed disclosures of potential conflicts in a way that I don't think they would have done before Halliburton and Chubb. So I suppose three procedural points there, one of which is arbitrators' disclosures in an attempt to avoid any accusations of conflict. Two, an increasing focus on, on the disclosure process in commodities arbitrations. And three, the implications of the new witness statement reforms for international arbitration generally, not least in commodities arbitrations. With that, that brings us to the end of our podcast. I hope it's been useful for everyone listening. And I hope you will join us again for the next in the series of Arbitral Insights Horizon Scanning. Thank you. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email Joseas de Garaga at jia at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, reedsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Reed Smith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome.
Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.